This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make wind turbine lightning protection easy. If you're a wind farm operator, stop settling for damaged turbine blades and constant downtime. Get your uptime back with our strike tape lightning protection system. Learn more in today's show notes or visit weatherguardwind.com slash strike tape. Welcome back. I'm Alan Hall. I'm Dan Blewett, and this is the Uptime Podcast, where we talk about wind energy, engineering, lightning protection, and ways to keep your wind turbines running. All right, welcome back to Uptime. This is episode 17. Alan, what's going on? Hey, busy weekend wind, huh? Uh, A lot of uh, good activity. You see some awakening a little bit on the wind side. And it uh, looks like Japan's doing some good things, trying to uh, expand their, their wind infrastructure. And Seamus Gamesa is making some inroads into India. Great. This has been going to be a great week. Yeah. So in today's show, we're going to cover a little bit on the, on the news side, like Alan mentioned. Um, there's been a good first quarter uh, for the wind industry, um, some expansion into India. We're going to talk about Japan a little bit and um, kind of briefly check on wildlife in the ocean so there's a a new um, good article came out about offshore wind and uh, maybe some of the implications on ocean wildlife then we're going to talk a little bit about bonding and grounding um, and some of the electrical issues that are posed uh, by wind turbines and i know alan you've had some questions recently with all that so we'll cover that uh, in the second half of our show today so first thing on the docket i mean so good first quarter for wind um so saw so nearly 14 gigawatts of wind turbine capacity ordered, ordered globally, which equates to an estimated $13.4 billion. So what do you what do you see with all this? I mean, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> I mean, this is becoming a, a pretty a main stable in the, not that it hasn't been, but things are looking up. Yeah, it's a good number. Yeah, that's a good number, right? So one gigawatt equals $1 billion in sales. That's what that says. Uh, That's a great number because as we talk about doing more and more gigawatts, that means uh, really big drivers of of local economies and uh, the the places where, uh, especially as we're seeing on the shorelines and around Europe and now some Suzlon getting back on their feet again, that's great for the world economy to have people working, which is what that says. In order to have $13 billion of of sales means a lot of people are working. And that's a good sign. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of capacity getting bought up by China. I mean, you look at um, some of the the charts here and they're just uh, looks like they're getting more and more aggressive. And Japan and Taiwan uh, orders for mm-hmm. their projects accounted for 33 percent of the quarter one global offshore wind turbine order intake and 42 yeah. percent of overall offshore demand in Asia. So, yeah, and it looks like uh, Vestas is uh, pretty a, a pretty big player in all of that. So. Yeah, they are. I mean, this is something that you just look at it and you're like, why don't we do more of this, especially in in North America, especially in America? I mean, offshore in America is still really sparse, which seems strange, right? It does seem strange, but I I just think the in general, well, in general, not specifically. And and in the northern latitudes of Europe, the storm, the seas are pretty choppy. It's scenic. And and well, it's just it's just the discussion about can you see it and where do you think it's an eyesore or not? Yeah. In Europe, it's not really an eyesore. In America, it's still seen as an eyesore. Offshore drilling rigs have been an eyesore, and California has essentially banned a lot of them over time. And until our attitudes change about them and see wind as being a, a definite sector in energy production, we're, we're going to have these problems. Unless he starts shoving the wind turbines far enough offshore, which I think is happening now. We're talking about going further and further offshore, particularly with the floating platforms that maybe you can get them far enough away, you really don't even notice them. And then Americans won't even care. And we'll be back making big wind wind turbines offshore again. But for the, for the main part right now, it's mostly on land sites, uh, mostly in the Midwest, Texas being the big driver in the United States right now. Yeah. Well, let's come back to that a little bit. So as we were kind of talking about some of the nuisances potentially posed by offshore. So some big studies done about just the way marine life is affected. Obviously, there's a lot of noise. There's the constant, you know, 
hum or drum or whatever you'd call it from you know just mm-hmm. wind turbines in operation obviously all the sure the installation driving piles for some of these uh ones that are embedded yep. into the into the sea rock and they're trying to figure out is this negatively harming the wildlife so uh, like some of this is pretty inconclusive good, right? and it is good that i mean that we need to obviously care for our planet and you don't want renewable energy which is meant to be at a benefit for the entire planet to be you know helping the human population but just decimating the the wildlife so it sounds like it's not too bad based on like preliminary measurements that maybe some of these animals are detecting sounds but the scope of the overall uh, like noise profile and just like i guess the density of the noise and the frequencies that they're probably not too impactful is that kind of what you gathered from uh from some of these studies yeah it it there's a little bit of overlap in terms of the noise generated by the offshore wind turbines and how they cross into sort of frequency ranges in which uh, marine life are using. But I think from an engineering perspective, if we know what we're up against on the design side, we can start mitigating those impacts, And but we need to get the data, right? So the, the first part of any engineering adventure is you're going to stumble onto some problem area because the technology relatively is new and you're looking in areas you never looked in before. We just need to get the data. We're not trying to be bad people and harm marine life, just like we're not trying to harm bats and birds, right? No one's trying to do that when they're designing the wind turbines. Yeah. What we're trying to do is just learn from what we've got and then adapt and see if we can find a way to coexist, right? And I, I do think... Um, as we go, I know there's been a big push on some other things that are in, in the sea. We're trying to have less impact on the marine life. We should do that for wind turbines. Why would wind turbines be excluded from that? But I, it's just it's just not enough data. Not a, really not enough data to respond to yet. Yeah, when I, I think this is a, a classic example of somewhere where the the principle of charity should be applied. Because like you said, I think a lot of time activists and people who are you know vouching for the marine wildlife they're saying you're doing this you're destroying like the bats you're destroying like we're not trying to do that like we need to apply the principle of charity here like look no one's actively being malicious towards wildlife and you're right we just need to gather data and figure out what's going on is it actually harming them the standard way that we're installing these things and if not then hey we're open to maybe changing that but you're right we just need you need to start with data first and like i said it sounds like you know the there's sort of two main sources of noise, like the pile driving much, uh, that's going to get deeper into the water. Like they're going to hear that a lot more, but it's also a short term. Like mm-hmm. it's going to, you know, once the piles are driven and that part of the installation is complete, then they move on and that's not there anymore. So it's a short term thing, but then the operational noise, you know, up to 20 years. For longer those, yeah. impact, mm-hmm. right. Much longer impact. That's the one you really want to try to mitigate as much as you can. And, and, my guess is that even on existing offshore wind turbines, as we get further and further out into sea, and it may become an issue, my my bet is that we can probably modify those existing wind turbines, knowing what the data is, to, to go ahead and make them a little quieter in those frequency ranges that marine life like to use or are used for communication. And fine, you know, I I, I just I just don't like the the the. the particularly the, the couple of articles that I've seen about this recently where it does seem like the battle engineers or the battle wind turbine companies trying to kill marine life. No, yeah, no, no one's trying not. to do that. No... It's just like, look, this is what it takes to install <laughs> no. these and what they do. No. Yeah, what they how they operate. And yeah, you're right. right. Everyone just needs to uh, come to the table and say, look, this is what we want. We want to keep everyone safe, including the right. marine life that can't speak for themselves. And so what can we do to accomplish that? But yeah, I think I think that's... Let's get to work. <laughs> but you're right. Engineers love problems, right? Let's get, just put it on the list. Yeah. Let's put it on the list and work it. And, right? and you're right. Measure, no, measuring it's... is the first step because if you don't have a measurement for it, mm-hmm. then we have no idea what we're trying to even even fix. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's switch back to onshore. So uh, Siemens Gamesa Renew- Renewable Energy, they've, they're launching a new turbine and they love uh, giving them these... Very technical names, the SG 3.4-145 and... Uh, DD. Yeah, right. And uh, this one's a 3.6 megawatt and it can deliver 48% more annual, annual energy than its predecessor, the SG 2.2-122. So this one, they said, is tailored uh, with 145 meter rotor diameter 
Um, it's pretty much tailored for that kind of those kind of conditions in India. So, mm -hmm. I mean, do you think this is a, is a trend? <laughs> yeah, I mean, how much how much can they really tailor for these environments? I mean, is wind not just wind? I guess is my question for you. Wind is wind, but where you place those wind turbines has a lot to do with how to maximize performance. In a hot locations, you just you, every wind turbine generates a lot of heat on its own. And you have to have, and they have cooling systems essentially. Just keep it simplistic. They have cooling systems in them to maintain st standard temperatures so the things can operate. And if you get in places where it's extremely hot or just not enough um, uh, humidity kind of plays into that too. So there, there's there's some places on this planet where you have to be a little more aggressive about the way you control the temperature of the units to maximize performance. Not every wind turbine is going to be designed this, the same. And also what the winds are. So you, you have this issue about what kind of winds you're typically seeing in that country. What are the... What are the uh, corrosive environments you're likely to see there is a lot of fine particle sand which tends to be very abrasive is there extreme temperatures extreme colds so you're not no longer just designing a generic wind turbine that you can ship anywhere in the world you're designing wind turbines that are specific to those locations because ultimately we're trying to maximize a lifetime and we can't do that producing generic wind turbines it's the same thing as this in cars right honda makes a car for Canada, that's different than the car for America, which I'm sure is different than the car in Mexico or South America or Japan, for that matter. Uh, and it's the same thing for wind turbines. You need to t take into consideration the climate that it's going to be in. And I think it's one of the, the big downfalls, and we'll talk about this later. The big downfall in wind turbines right now is the lifetime and how uh, it's being the lifetime of wind turbines is being compared to the lifetime of other energy sources like nuclear. And I just saw a tweet today talking about uh, new advanced Russian nuclear sites that are going to be designed for 100 years of lifetime. Well, that's sort of hard to compete against if you're going to have to replace wind turbines five times over that 100 years. That's not a, a good advertising um, focus, right? We need to be able to do better than 20 years. And right now, I think a lot of wind turbines, particularly the older ones, are not going to quite make 20 years. It's a big drawback on the industry. So we got to start thinking about some of these other other environmental impacts uh, to get the lifetime up. That's what it means. Well, as so, I mean, 20 years is such a long period of time. I mean, you think about like mm -hmm. the lifespan of technology for all other sectors. Like what was a computer 20 mm -hmm. years ago? Like, would you even want a computer? for? No, 20, yeah. You know what I mean? And so no. obviously like. Well, airplanes. Airplanes are 50 years old. A lot of airplanes are 50 years old okay. or older. Good, I mean, 50 years old good is 70s, Good counterexample. Right? All right. All right. But I guess my point right. was, cars. Cars. Are, do yeah. we want to replace them every 10 years? Like in 10 years, is it better just to knock the thing down? Because now we have one the same size, cheaper cost, that's like 20 megawatts, 10, you know, 10 years into the future. Maybe. Maybe. maybe or maybe they just maybe, become obsolete maybe. and as technology just speeds, speeds and zips ahead. I don't know. Well, I, I, there's there's something to be. I think the airplane comparison is is a valid comparison in this sense. There's we know a lot about aerodynamics on wind turbine blades, and we know that they're really efficient, doing what they're doing. Where the inefficiency comes tends to be in the instrumentation, the communication, the efficiency may not be there, and they can be retrofit. I think if we start thinking about each one being a, a retrofitable design so that we can modify it over time and improve it. Like if we did a software upgrade to a wind turbine and got another three percent of power, nobody will complain about that. Nobody. If mm -hmm. we had to add ten thousand dollars to a wind turbine to, to increase another percent, we would totally do that. Uh, so I, I think the airplane analogy is similar because that's the way airplanes have been is that fifty year old airplanes just get the guts <laughs> the guts of them get changed out the engines don't really change the the shape of them don't really change but all the electrical and, and systems do change and get improved over time and wind turbines should be the same way because you've already made the investment why do you want to buy a whole new one probably don't need it yeah probably don't need it yeah no that makes sense that's uh, that is an interesting analogy because you're right like the blades like you said probably aren't going to change that much the towers a lot no. of the cost that goes into it's no. probably going to remain relatively constant and i mean they have for a while now too so okay. okay right and the differential cost to operate in another year 
is probably relatively small at year 18, 19, 20. And then, you know, if, if you got that, if you already pretty much paid off the thing in the first couple of years, which tends to be what happens, then all those other years are just pure profit. So why do you want to mess with that? It's like going to the casino and knowing every, every 50th pull on that, on the, on the slot machine is going to pay out. <laughs> I think I want to keep doing that if it's going to, if it's going to pay out. And wind turbines are kind of like that. They can be just pure money generation machines as long as the maintenance operational costs are controlled. They'll, they will live those things forever. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. It's Because uh, we're getting to the point of some of these wind turbines where we're getting to like year 10-ish, 12-ish, 13-year-ish. <laughs> <laughs> we're on the downhill slope and we're having trouble seeing year 20 come to fruition. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right. So last thing here on news. So Japan is going to develop offshore wind farms. Uh, they they want to be 30 sites in the next 10 years and they've uh, adjusted some policies to make that happen. So um, what's your take here? What's what's Japan doing? It seems like they're they're making big moves. Well, the, the Fukushima nuclear I, won't, I guess we'll call it disaster for all intents and purposes, has really changed the way that Japan has thought about energy creation. And obviously it's going to drive them to non-nuclear decisions. I'm not necessarily think that's ultimately the right solution, but it's probably a temporary solution. Uh, but they're talking about one gigawatt per year. That's like a billion dollars a year. Like we're just talking about it's roughly a billion dollars a year of investment. That's a lot of money. Uh, to for Japan, a relatively small company, to be putting into to wind, so they're making a statement. And I think also when they do that, my guess is that a lot of that turbines are going to be homegrown. Makes sense. But the Japanese have done a pretty good job of making some of the wind turbines too. So maybe they want to outgrow their their wind turbine industry by just using locally as an example to then get to the a wider, broader market, right? Um, that would make sense. I mean, have you seen all, a lot of European countries invest heavily into wind to develop the technology and to become world leaders in it? Why wouldn't Japan? They obviously have the capability to do that. Yeah. And so their new policy, their goals are uh, three or four projects every year that will each generate a total capacity of about a gigawatt uh, from financial years, April 2021 until uh, 2030 or 2031. So yeah, that 10 gigawatt number that you mentioned. So that's it's pretty interesting. I mean, that's Yeehaw. that's a lot, yeah, and <laughs> it's a lot, right? It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of investment. Uh, good for them, right? Especially in this economic downturn, we want to get things rolling again. That's a good way to do it. Pump a bunch of money to the economy, and and uh, on the backside, you got clean renewable energy. All right, so let's let's shift gears here to our our second half of the show, and. Uh, we have a couple of things to cover because you know you've been talking with a bunch of customers recently, and uh, a, a bunch of other companies, and and kind of dispelling some myths about specifically bonding and and grounding on some of these wind turbines. So I know one of the mm -hmm. questions you've gotten recently is, uh, what is what should bonding resistance be on a wind turbine blade? When's it too high? How do we check this? <laughs> I mean, this is you know your expertise you know the electrical engineering stuff so um what do you what have you got for us on on bonding well when we say bonding and grounding what we're doing is we're measuring the resistance from point a to point b and in this particular case it has to be from the the blade receptors the lightning receptors either back to the hub typically in some cases like to measure it down to the to the base of the tower where they have a, a known bonding point uh, what the questions I'm getting lately are very specific of what is an acceptable bonding resistance. And I, I always think that's kind of odd because one, the OEM should be defining that and have measured it before the blades in particular have left the factory. So there should be <laughs> a resistance check of a blade is uh, maybe a 15 minute task and it doesn't take any advanced skills or any sophisticated instrumentation to go do. So before each blade leaves a factory, there should be some sort of bonding check and a written down number you're gonna pass on to the operator of that thing. But what's happening now, what appears to be happening is um, there have been resistance checks done on the blades when they leave and then when they get out in the field, they're different values. And over time, those values are getting higher and higher and higher. So let's just throw some numbers out. So say say they measure 10 milliohms, which is a pretty decent resistance. And it's going to 50, 100, 
milliohms to one ohm in some cases or higher. And the question is, what impact does it have on the lightning protection system? Will it still work? And, like, and well, that's a really great question, right? It, gets, it all depends. It really all depends on what has gone wrong or why the resistance is changing. Not to say re- resistance is going to rise naturally because corrosion happens. Welcome to the world. Corrosion happens. Any sort of resistive joint that's sort of butt, butted together or screwed together is going to change over time because corrosion, oxidation, all those salt, you name it, start to make the resistance rise in those joints. But from a, a larger perspective, those lightning protection systems are designed with big conductors, and it seems like those joints are fairly good sized. So if the blade was going to get struck by lightning, it should still be going down those conductors in the in the down conductor and through all the receptors to get to where it wants to go. And a lot of times, a small lightning strike, even a large lightning strike, will clean out all those high resistances and make them low again, kind of arc welds things together. So it seems to be a concern in general between a high resistance reading, when I say high, say it's up by a factor of 10. So it went from 10 milliohms to 100 milliohms. And a concern whether the lightning persistence lightning protection system works it's it has to work unless there's something catastrophic has happened to the blade like the down conductor has been severed in two or something's become disconnected a technician's been in there and disconnected something by accident or taken apart to work on something and connected back up at the end uh because otherwise the the pathway is still there the cross-sectional area of metal from a to b from the receptor back to the hub is still there it's just those intermediate joints, maybe a little bit high in resistance, but hey, some light, lightning current will clear them out. It's just like uh, getting some grime on your car. You know, you wash your car off and then it looks shiny again. Same thing happens with electrical joints. Very similar. And But Dan, you know you know what we've seen lately? I've seen a lot more of lately. Obviously, to go out and measure resistance on a blade it can be really time intensive, right? You got to climb up there. You got to have an instrument, a, an ohmmeter, and you're going to slide down the blade, click onto the receptor, click onto whatever the other end of the wire has got to go, and so it just takes a lot of time. But there's been a couple of companies now on the drone side that are trying to, to automate that, like to to either through rip some sort of rope contraption or some sort of flying drone, whether <laughs> trying to measure the resistance of the receptors. It seems like there's been more demand of that in the last six months than I've seen in the previous. Five years. Yeah. Have you seen that too? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. increasing. Yeah. It's increasing a lot. And they're offering that service. And I don't know if just the operators don't realize that probably not a lot to worry about unless it gets to be like a quote-unquote open circuit where things are completely disconnected. That I would worry about that. But anything else, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the OEMs would even say it, needs, it would cause a problem. Um, and the weird thing is on the... I, I, I've talked to a couple OEMs about this, and I'm not sure they've defined it either, which is weird because on other, on automotive, in the automotive industry, in the aerospace industry, in in buildings, there's defined measures that need to be kept in place to make sure the system is working properly. Basically, just make sure something catastrophic hasn't happened to the lightning protection system. And on wind turbines, we don't, maybe it's just the older wind turbines we didn't do that on. I think the newer ones are doing a much better job of it, but some of the older ones, we just don't seem to have any numbers, which is odd. <laughs> yeah, well, it, that definitely doesn't seem like something on, on their list of, you know, you start talking about even when they no. know they have damage, they don't want to go up there and fix it because they just might not need to yet. So the idea right. of going up and testing <laughs> resistance seems like that would never happen almost. Right, but it, I've, I've, like I said, I've seen more resistance measurements in the COVID-19 world. <laughs> And I saw previous to it. So I don't know if it's just um, good sales and marketing or there's some sort of industry-wide problem that everybody's responding to. Not sure that one's settled out because I have. there has been very little written about it, mm-hmm. which is trouble. Again, I get back to the wind turbine industry not writing about itself and, <laughs> and communicating yeah, generic problems sure. to the industry. Yeah. Very secretive, which is crazy because it's not helping the industry. Especially things like this, like bonding resistance. That's like first semester electrical engineering. Uh, it's not super technical. We should be able to share information on that. It's weird. Apparently not. I mean, you know, the, I don't know. I just don't, it seems like a situation where any company is like, well, better safe than sorry. 
we don't want to look like the fool if we're the one who decides that oh it's no big deal and then it backfires you know heads within the company might have to roll stuff like that i mean you could see how like the fear the fear (laughs) could be pervasive in a company like that where we might as well just err on the side of doing what we've been doing and not let any any kind of trade secrets if you even call them that get out because yeah I w- yeah i wouldn't call I bonding know. a trade secret no yeah i wouldn't call uh, it's just so generic <laughs> it's like the wind turbines are are white in color that's not a trade secret <laughs> the bonding resistance should be low yeah should be low so it's it's not much more difficult than that i i i think that there was a generic problem uh, or maybe and maybe it's location specific. I, the ones I worry about the most are the ones that are out on the ocean. And one, that's hard to go out and measure those things. And two, the bonding resistance is probably going up because the salt is, is just a negative, corrosive thing. What are you going to do, right? At some part of it, you just have to live with it. I, I, I just, yeah. As we can talk about the secrecy, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, do you think it's something that can be solved with different materials? I mean. Are there any metals that I mean? When you talk about these these joints, these that are bonded, what materials are you yeah. typically talking about? Is it typically Cop- copper? Copper, stainless. Yeah, they try to make them gal- galvanically compatible, so they'll be similar materials. Like you don't want to see aluminum and stainless steel put together, but I've heard <laughs> heard of in some wind turbines that's actually a case. So galvanically, that that makes a battery. That's how batteries work: is to get two different galvanically opposed uh, metals, and that creates a voltage. Does that mean they're they're tra- they're sending ions to each other? Is that is that how that works? Or correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, once 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 taking yeah. them for the other. Usually aluminum, usually aluminum gets eaten up in that situation, and so it'll actually eat away the aluminum and eat away any sort of structure that it was providing slowly over time. Um, so stainless steel will try to eat aluminum, uh, copper will try to eat aluminum. So you try to find things that are closer together galvanically. Uh, that's the way to, to mitigate that. The other thing I've seen a lot more recently in the in the building community and just the general industry community is sort of fusion welding where they hot weld uh, part A mm-hmm. to part B. Boy, that's a great electrical connection, and it, it's reliable. It's all get out. I think trains do that. So, um, where they, they just don't want them to break. On, on wind terms, it's hard to do because you're in this environment where things are flammable. <laughs> so fusing metal together is probably not the right place for that to happen. Uh, but good mechanical joints are not a mystery. And good electrical joints are not a mystery either. They can do both of those things. You just got to think about what metals you're using and keeping water and corrosion out of them. So sealing those sealing those joints up is usually key to a very, very long lifetime. All right, well, we're going to wrap up today's episode of Uptime. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you're a regular here, thank you for your continued support. Please subscribe to the show and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from each show. For Alan and all of us at WeatherGuard, stay safe and we'll see you next week. Is downtime causing you financial pain and putting a stop to your power production for months on end? It's no secret, lightning strike damage is a major cause of wind turbine downtime. This damage is preventable with our easy-to-install strike tape lightning protection system for wind turbine blades. Our incredible engineering, build quality, materials, and edge sealants withstand up to five times more abuse in the toughest weather and lightning conditions. And we've got the research to prove it. If you're tired of constant downtime, we can help. Reach out to us at weatherguardwind.com and schedule a free call. We'll get your uptime back in no time.